So the next example we're going to look at is going to really illustrate what happens if you are careless when you convert non-template code, especially non-template code that works only on scalar types, to template code that can work with arbitrary types. And this will give us a chance to start to talk about the more subtle issues of exception handling that up to this point we've kind of been sweeping under the rug, as it were. So let's take a look at this example. You'll see this example at first blush looks similar to the one we had before um, in that we're going to make some stacks and we're going to check whether the stack is full and we're going to push into it. We're going to check while the stack is not empty and we're going to pop from it and read the top item and so on and so forth. But what I want you to focus on here is that we're now going to parameterize our stack with a different type. Last time we used int. And int is a very forgiving type because it won't throw an exception. If you assign one int to another, that's pretty much guaranteed not to throw an exception. In contrast, we're going to parameterize our stacks now with a type that's guaranteed to throw an exception. Now, I did this primarily for illustrative purposes, but the point generalizes to, to real code in real situations. So there's a, a class, which I've given the somewhat sinister name throw exception to, which should be a a dead giveaway that it's going to cause trouble. And here's the class. So throw exception is going to basically um, have a, a constructor and a uh, an operator that converts the object of type throw exception to an int. It's a conversion operator. But the real thing I want to focus on is the assignment operator. And we'll take a look at that. You'll also notice that it's got a couple of fields in the private part. One is just a good old non-static int, it's an instance method, but one is a static int. And you're gonna see what we're gonna use the static int for in a second. So if you go look at the implementation of this throw exception class, this devious, malicious throw exception class, you'll see that the assignment operator is going to increment that static int, which is defined down here to start with the initial value of zero. What does it mean for something to be static, you might ask? Well, what that means is it's actually a class variable, not an instance variable. So the way to think about that is that there's one instance of this variable that's shared by all the different classes. So it's, it's kind of like a scoped global variable, if you will. It's in the scope of this class. And what we're going to do is every time the assignment operator is called, we're going to increment i underscore by 1. And when it reaches the magic number 3, it's going to throw the out of range exception. And I intentionally did this just to be devious and malicious. Obviously, nobody would write code like this in practice, but it mimics the problems that can arise when your code does, in fact, run into an error, like you've run out of memory or some other condition wasn't satisfied, and it's forced to throw an exception. Uh, in fact, there's actually a whole testing paradigm called um, Simeon Army or Chaos Monkey that Netflix popularized, where they intentionally inject random faults or defects into their code in order to see whether people are handling those problems in the software that they write. Uh, so this is kind of in the, in the spirit of uh, Chaos Monkey and, and Simeon Army. OK, so this code will throw an exception. So let's go ahead and take a look and see what happens when we run this code. And you can see, lo and behold, we get an out of range error. And that occurs at some point when we're copying the third item it blows up. It's like a time bomb. Um, now, this will demonstrate problems with our software. And to illustrate these problems, let's go over and switch over to my Linux account. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to find a memory checker tool that works nicely for the Mac. I'm sure there's one out there. I just don't happen to know one off the top of my head. So this is my Linux computer. And it supports Valgrind, which is a memory checker tool. And I want to show you two different use cases. The first use case is the use case when we had the code that, that used ints. So here's the code where we used a stack that was parameterized by int. And if I run this code, you'll see, first of all, when I run the code, it works just fine. It's, it doesn't have the throw exception uh, class in there. And then moreover, when I run Valgrind on this code, it'll go ahead and instrument the code transparently and then say, hey, you're perfectly fine. There are no memory problems here. Conversely, here's the version we're looking at now. And when I run this code, this is the code that has the throw exception instantiation. 
when I run this code, I get the range error. Well, is that a problem? And the answer is yes, it's a problem. And I can prove that by running valgrind on this code. And you'll see when I run valgrind on this code, it tells me that I lost memory. I lost 40 bytes. And it actually tells me where I lost the memory. And we're going to go see in a second where I lost it. You can see that I lost it here in the copy constructor for the stack. So we're going to go over and see what's going on with the copy constructor. But I wanted you to see what happens when you run your code with a, a legitimate memory checking tool. All right, so let's go over here now and look at stack. Stack is the same stack we've been looking at up to this point. It's a generic stack. It's templatized by type T. And it's got some cool new methods, which we'll take a look at later in a different context because we're focusing on memory errors at the moment. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the implementation. And this is actually the method that was blowing up. This is the method that was leaking memory. Why is it leaking memory? How can it leak memory? Well, let's take a look at how we define this thing. We define stack to have three data members in the private part. Top, which keeps track of the current top. Size, which keeps track of the amount of memory we allocated. And then we have a pointer to a value type, where value type is just a type def for type T, which is the parameter for the class. This type def is what's commonly called a trait. And we'll talk a lot more about traits later in the course when we talk about standard template library. So just think of this as being a pointer to T or a pointer to the value type. When we come over here, you can see that our constructor allocates us a new array of T. Well, that seems reasonable. And you'll see that our destructor down here deletes the T, the, the stack, of t using the delete syntax that you always have to make sure you're explicitly using when you have destructors that need to delete arrays. In this, in this case, it was an array because we allocated as an array up here. Well, so far, so good. But there's a problem. When we take a look at the copy constructor, this is where things go awry. And the reason why things go awry here is that we're using new t to allocate a new array of t of the proper size, of the right-hand side size. That would be, for example, something like this, where we're going to initialize s3 from s2, which has the size 10. Well, here's the problem. If you take a look at what happens next, we have a loop that goes for i equals 0, i less than right-hand side size, or RHS size. And here's where we get ourselves into trouble. This call here, stack underscore sub i assigned RHS stack underscore sub i. When we instantiate stack with int, not a problem. When we instantiate stack with the evil throw exception, then after the third time or so through, the assignment operator is going to throw an exception. Well, why does that cause problems? Don't we have a destructor? Well, we have a destructor, but the semantics of C++ are that constructors that don't complete their bodies, in other words, they don't finish everything inside the curly braces in the constructor, will not call the destructor if an exception is thrown in the constructor. And of course, there's a good reason for that. The good reason is that they don't, the C++ compiler doesn't know how far you got before the exception was thrown. So it doesn't know what the state of the fields are. So it doesn't want to call the destructor to try to accidentally clean something up that, that uh, has never been initialized, for example. So what will happen is here, we've allocated this memory, but then an exception's thrown here, and there's no way that that memory gets cleaned up the way we've written the code. Now, we could rewrite the code somewhat like this. We could say try, and then we could come down here, and we could say uh, oops, try catch, and then we could say, you know, um, in this particular case, let's just say exception. I, I would have to go ahead and define that in the scope. Let's see if it'll do it for me. Um, there we go. So we, we change it to standard exception. And then I could say something like delete stack. That would be one way to make my code exception safe in this particular case. Um, but then, I'm just postponing the inevitable. Uh, if I go down here, I would have to come down here and do the same thing in the assignment operator. I'd have to go and make a try-catch block around the assignment operator. 
which I could do, but there are two problems with putting try catch blocks in code like this. Problem number one is it gets ugly. Very quickly, your code is strewn with try catch blocks and uh, it gets hard to differentiate the, the real code, the code that's handling the normal path versus the code that's handling the exception path. And you can forget to delete things. It just gets ugly and tedious and error prone to write. That's problem number one. Problem number two is anytime you use try catch blocks in a method, it causes the compiler to generate extra code. So you have additional time and space overhead. And so in that particular case, your, your code will be correct, but it'll be bigger and potentially a little bit slower as well. So we'd really, 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 really like to not have to use try catch blocks unless absolutely necessary. And by the way, the point of all this is not to say don't use try catch blocks. It's to say, make sure you use try catch blocks judiciously and use them correctly and don't just throw them all over your code to, to solve problems that can be solved better other ways.